Of all of history's great military commanders, who was number one? We did a deep dive into the achievements of the generals from antiquity through the 20th century and found these to be the 15 best of all time. Widely known by his nickname of El Libertador, Simon Bolivar's exploits in South America during the early 19th century easily make him one of history's best commanders. Bolivar received military training as a young boy in his home country of Venezuela, and though his first campaigns to liberate his homeland were unsuccessful, he rebounded and within a few years was establishing his military chops. Bolivar's first victories came against the Spanish, who were determined to maintain their foothold on the continent. To staff his army, Bolivar created a combined force of Haitian Creoles, Venezuelan slaves, other anti-royalists, and foreign British and Irish soldiers. Bolivar snuck up on the far more experienced Spanish army at the Battle of Bojica in Colombia, winning decisively and taking around 1,800 prisoners. After his victory, Bolivar established Gran Colombia in 1819. Bolivar soon liberated massive amounts of territory, including Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, named in his honor by his subordinates. Ultimately, Bolivar's empire was beset by civil war and didn't last, but it's impossible to deny his genius. Immortalized in the Hollywood epic 300, Spartan King Leonidas deserves a claim for his bravery and ingenuity. Leonidas ruled during the late 5th century BC, and his victory as the leader of Greek forces against King Xerxes and the Persians in the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC show his brilliance. At Thermopylae, Leonidas' army was about 7,000 strong, while scholars estimate that Xerxes had as many as 300,000 men on his side. Aware that the odds were against him, Leonidas made Xerxes push his army through the narrow Thermopylae Pass, which forced them to fight the Greeks hand-to-hand, -hand, to the Persians' disadvantage. The Greeks held out for days against relentless Persian attacks, inflicting countless casualties. The Greeks finally fell because of the traitor Epialtes informed the Persians about a secret passageway, allowing them to flank and defeat the Greeks. Without Epialtes' betrayal, the Persians may never have gotten through. But even when Leonidas knew he was surrounded, he fought to the death alongside his 300 elite Spartan soldiers, refusing to surrender. The world will know that free men stood against a tyrant, that few stood against many. Ultimately, Leonidas' cunning tactics enabled the Greeks to hold out for days against a force more than 40 times their strength. His feat was one of the greatest military achievements in history and indicative of a true military leader. Timur Lank, also known as Timur, Timur the Lame, or Tamerlane, was a 14th century conqueror who began as a nomad and became the most important man in Asia. Born in a Turkish-Mongol tribe in 1336, by 1370, Tamerlane became leader of Transoxiana in present-day Uzbekistan. He soon built one of history's most vicious armies. While it's hard to gauge how big his army was, some estimates put it as high as 200,000 men. Tamerlane was constantly expanding his empire through brutal conquests. At its height, the Timurid Empire spanned west from present-day southern Turkey all the way to China in the east and from the Aral and Caspian Seas in the north down to the Arabian Sea in the south. It was an almost unprecedented swath of territory, and Tamerlane was at the forefront of the army during all of its conquests. A relative of Genghis Khan by marriage, Tamerlane employed similar fighting tactics that highlighted the strength and mobility of his nomad army. When it came to weapons, they used whatever they had at their disposal. The fact that Tamerlane's empire quickly fell apart once he died proves how valuable he was. Given the nickname Timur the Lame only by his detractors, Tamerlane's dominance was unparalleled in his time. The ancient Greek commander Themistocles came to prominence during the Greco-Persian Wars, and it was his foresight and tactical skill at the 480 BC Battle of Salamis that helped save Greece from destruction. At Salamis, Themistocles was at the head of a small force of Greeks, taking on the formidable Persian navy that greatly outnumbered them, possibly by hundreds of ships. He had to turn a disadvantage into an advantage, the fact that he had fewer ships than the Persians. Through Themistocles' leadership, the Greeks forced a Persian retreat and ended the naval invasion. During the fighting, Themistocles personally commanded hundreds of vessels, luring the Persian force into narrow straits. This allowed the Greeks to overpower and sink hundreds of Persian ships while only losing a few dozen of their own. Without Themistocles' foresight and savvy, the Greeks would have been obliterated at Salamis, and Western history would have been completely different. By the end of his four-decade reign, Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, was king of the Franks and the Lombards and Holy Roman Emperor, and he had his military prowess to thank for it. Charlemagne came to the throne of the Frankish kingdom in 768 following the death of his father, King Pepin the Short. His first victories came in 769 against rebels in Aquitaine and Gascony. A few years later, in 772, he invaded Saxony, kicking off three decades of warfare. 
With a reputation even larger than his formidable 6-foot, 3-inch figure, Charlemagne was known as a warrior king who personally commanded his troops to victory. Historians credit him with uniting Christian Europe for the first time. As he subjugated Saxony, Charlemagne led his armies to victory in Italy against the Lombards, in Gaul against the Omidids, and in Bavaria against the Avars. As a result, he became the first Holy Roman Emperor in 800, a title he would hold until his death 14 years later. His more than 40 years of continuous rule and military expansion make him among the longest-lasting commanders in history, and his kingdom among the greatest. In 1740, Frederick II came to power in Prussia after the death of his father, Frederick William I. Although his father left him a well-trained army, historians often credit Frederick II with establishing Germany's strict military tradition. During his rule, Frederick II fought two great wars, the War of Austrian Succession from 1740 to 1748 and the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 1763. Frederick was renowned for his fearlessness in battle, as he was willing to fight when others would have surrendered or fled. During the Austrian War, he retook Silesia after a century of occupation, and his leadership during the Seven Years' War was legendary. At the Battle of Leuten, Frederick II beat an Austrian force more than twice the size of his and captured a quarter of the enemy's soldiers. At the Battle of Rosbach, Frederick's defeat of the French army was so decisive that the French reassessed their entire military philosophy afterward. Frederick II earned his nickname the Great due to his military talents, which resulted in a solid 46 years of power. During that time, he was able to strengthen the Prussian army for the future. Hernán Cortés might not have had the longest military career, but his achievement at Tenochtitlan is among the most impressive in history. At Tenochtitlan, Cortés used a masterful combination of strategy and planning to bring about the destruction of the mighty Aztec Empire. A Spanish conquistador, Cortés landed in Mexico in 1519 with about 600 men and barely a dozen horses, but he quickly recruited enough locals to almost triple his forces. Aware that the massive Aztec civilization and army were waiting for them, Cortes wisely made an alliance with the local Tlaxcala natives who resented their treatment by the Aztecs and wanted to see them defeated. Cortes and his army marched on Tenochtitlan in 1519, immediately imprisoning the Aztec leader Montezuma, despite their small population. After briefly being forced to abandon Tenochtitlan following an Aztec revolt under one of Cortes' subordinates, Cortes defeated them at Otumba before laying siege to the city. His small Spanish force was supplemented by around 100,000 Tlaxcalans, Collins, and after months of relentless fighting, Cortes took the Aztec capital in August 1521. The Aztec Empire was made up of millions loyal to Montezuma, but Cortes immediately made himself their ruler. It was his alliance with the natives that enabled his victory, making this one of the most masterful military campaigns in history. Though he might be persona non grata to many in the West, Bowen Zapp's accomplishments are almost unparalleled among modern leaders. A student of Chinese Communist leader Mao Zedong's military theories, Zap turned the North Vietnamese army from practically nothing into one of the most formidable in military history. From 1946 to 1954, Zap's fledgling NVA took on the highly trained French army, eventually stunning the French by defeating them at Dien Bien Phu. It was Zap's amassing of an overwhelming supply of artillery, along with the army's ability to move heavy equipment through mountain jungles that sealed the French fate. During the Second Indochina War, known better in America as the Vietnam War, Zap led the NVA against the even more powerful United States Army, but once again defeated them. Aware that U.S. forces were far superior in manpower and arms, he used guerrilla warfare to slowly wear down the Americans. Our aim was to break their will to continue the war and make them withdraw their troops. As a military genius and architect behind the NVA victories over both the French and the U.S., it's impossible to deny Zap's military capabilities. His victory at Dien Bien Phu was a benchmark in terms of achievements for Third World Revolutionary Armies, and Vietnam wouldn't exist today without him. Saladin was a powerful Kurdish and Muslim sultan and founder of the Ayyubi dynasty, who made his mark during the 12th century Crusades. He began his career fighting under his uncle for the Emir Nur al-Din during the Second Crusade, and upon the Emir's death in 1174, Saladin set out on a mission to unify the Muslim world under Sunni instead of Shiite Islam rule. Within a few years, Saladin brought Egypt, Yemen, and southern Syria under his control, though Aleppo remained out of his reach at first. However, he soon conquered Aleppo and then Mosul before declaring jihad against the Crusaders' Latin states. In 1187, at the Battle of Hattin, Saladin's troops defeated a powerful Frankish Crusader force, leaving the door open to the most important of the Latin states, the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Saladin then took Jerusalem, evicting the Franks for the first time since they established the kingdom nearly a century earlier. Saladin enhanced his stature by showing restraint. Rather than slaughter the Jerusalem Christians, he allowed them to buy their freedom. 
Saladin's military skills are matched by his reputation for benevolence and humility. He earned the respect of even his most ardent foes. By the age of 26, Carthaginian general Hannibal Barca was already a competent commander. He was so popular among his troops that they made him their leader in 221 BC, and he didn't let them down. Despite his youth, Hannibal successfully spread Carthaginian influence throughout the Iberian Peninsula. His 219 attack on Saguntum sparked the Second Punic War against Rome, which would prove to be his finest hour. To fight the Romans, Hannibal took his army of around 100,000, including 37 war elephants, on a 1,000-mile trek through the Pyrenees and Swiss Alps. Although the strenuous march thinned their numbers, Hannibal still defeated Roman general Publius Cornelius Scipio, but even greater things lay ahead in 216 at the Battle of Cannae. There, Hannibal invented what is known as double envelopment, which he used to destroy a Roman force 80,000 strong despite having only half as many soldiers. Hannibal split his force into three columns, and when the Romans attacked the center, the two side columns enveloped the Roman force from the flanks and rear, destroying them. It was one of the greatest attacks in history, and more than 2,000 years later, Hannibal's techniques are still in use. Prior to serving two terms as President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower had a prolific military career. Born in 1890, Eisenhower was educated at military schools including West Point and the Army War College. While he didn't fight in the First World War, Eisenhower earned the Distinguished Service Star of the Philippines in the interwar years for helping retool their army, an early indication of his command skills. During World War II, Eisenhower led three of the most important Allied invasions. First, he spearheaded the invasion of Africa, known as Operation Torch, in November 1942. He also commanded the Allied invasion of Sicily in June 1943, shortly after Torch was completed. This led to him becoming the supreme commander of Allied Expeditionary Forces the following December, where he undertook the Allied invasion of Normandy, known as Operation Overlord. The invasions of Africa, Sicily, and Normandy were the biggest turning points in the war, ensuring the Allied victory, and they were successful thanks to Eisenhower's planning and military genius. Napoleon Bonaparte is perhaps history's greatest modern commander. Born in 1769 in Corsica, Bonaparte was educated at military academies and was already commissioned by the army by the time he was a teenager. During the early years of the French Revolution, he stood on the sidelines, but in 1793, he rejoined the French army and earned accolades during the Siege of Toulon and in the fight against Austria. Though he was advised to mount a cross-channel invasion of England, Bonaparte knew it was a bad idea due to the strength of the British Royal Navy. Instead, he concentrated his forces in Egypt, defeating the Mamluk who ruled there for centuries. While his Asian and African campaigns ultimately ended in failure, Bonaparte became Emperor of France in 1804. During his reign, he expanded French territory throughout Europe, defeating the larger Austrian and Russian armies several times and governing territory from southern Italy to present-day Germany. Your Majesty, hmm. we are discovered. Good. In a few short years, Bonaparte had almost single-handedly restored French military prestige in Europe. However, his disastrous invasion of Russia was his downfall. Nevertheless, Napoleon's contributions in the field of military tactics and strategy are almost unparalleled among modern generals, and he is easily a top five military commander of all time. Few names are as synonymous with military excellence as Genghis Khan. Born in 1162 in northern Mongolia, Khan started to build his reputation as the ultimate warrior when, as a teenager, he rescued his wife from captivity. During his career, Khan created a mega empire that's considered to be the largest in human history. At its peak, Khan commanded territory from Korea on the outskirts of Eastern Asia to present-day Hungary, about 11 to 12 million contiguous square miles. Khan united the nomadic steppe tribes of modern-day Mongolia before expanding his empire into northern China, then west towards modern-day Afghanistan and Iran. Khan used his cavalry to devastating effect, and his tactics were ingenious. For example, he once faked a withdrawal only to come roaring back and initiate a siege, using enemy captives as human shields in the process. Khan's legacy lies in his ability to create a massive army out of conquered subjects, his masterful use of cavalry, his ability to use smaller forces to defeat larger ones, and the mind-blowing size of his empire. There are few names in history as famous as that of Julius Caesar. Thought to be born in 100 BC, Caesar began his career as a junior officer in the Roman army. However, it was after becoming consul in the year 59, leading to the defeat of neighboring Gaul from the years 58 to 50, that Caesar's star began to rise. During the civil war against Pompey, Caesar's prowess as a commander was on full display as he quickly conquered lands in Italy, Spain, and Macedonia, and invaded northern Africa. At its peak, Caesar's empire nearly formed a complete ring around the Mediterranean Sea. 
He held territory stretching from the Caspian Sea to the Strait of Gibraltar, something almost unfathomable for that time period. As a commander, Caesar was renowned for his impeccable skill in organizing and training the Roman army. He made sure they were in top shape for battle, and he led by example. In battle, he made quick, smart decisions, and he earned his troops' loyalty by giving them commendations and promotions. To many, Caesar was the finest of all the Roman generals, and his conquests were certainly the greatest. When it comes to Alexander the Great, it's often impossible to separate fact from fiction. But even if a fraction of what is said about him is true, he clearly stands alone as history's greatest commander. He defeated the Theban army in 338, and two years later he ascended to the Macedonian throne. After becoming king, Alexander began to amass what would become the greatest empire of its time. He defeated Darius and the Persians in present-day Turkey before taking on the Phoenicians in the area of the Levant at Tyre. He then turned his sights to Egypt and Persia, conquering both before uniting them to create a contiguous empire that stretched from Anatolia all the way to the western edges of India. His vision of a united world was, well, it was unprecedented. Unfortunately, there aren't many contemporary sources on Alexander's life, leaving historians to fill in the blanks. Still, he's greatly revered for the almost unimaginable extent of his empire and his many victories in battle. Alexander took on some of the greatest armies of the day, and he beat them all. At a time when skill and not technology determined the outcome of battle, Alexander proved himself to be head and shoulders above the rest.